Good morning, everybody. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. And today our program is going to be a little different from prior programs. We're going to focus on criminal law and defense. My guest is Ken Lawson, who is a professor at William S. Richardson School of Law, the University of Hawaii. And he teaches criminal law and procedure, professional responsibility, evidence. He's the co-director of the Innocence Project. He recently traveled to Hong Kong, where he spoke to Chinese criminal defense attorneys about effective representation in death penalty cases, uh, how to save a life. Uh, we will discuss criminal law today and sentencing and maybe a little bit about how he got involved in criminal law and what has changed since then, what he discovered in Hong Kong. Ken, welcome. Good to see you. Good thanks, to see you, Mark. For thanks, for having, no, thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, our pleasure. Our pleasure. I'd like to ask you a little bit of just about your background. How did you, I mean, what drew you to criminal law? And I, we were talking earlier about how uh, you, I used to get appointed to do some cases. Yeah. I, I didn't really choose to do those cases. I got appointed and I, I liked doing them. I enjoyed doing them, uh, although they were very stressful, some criminal cases. In the old days, they used to appoint right. law, lawyers to represent defendants in yeah. criminal cases. But how, how did you get involved in it? Did, it? did you choose it or did it choose you? Or a little no, bit of I, both? <laughs> I, I always wanted to, to, to be a, a criminal defense attorney, right? I, and I think there has to be, in order for people to be good at criminal defense, there has to be some rebel involved. And at least that was for rebel, me, right? Yeah. You, you know, there was a rebel in me that um, hated bullies, you know what I mean? And, and there was always something in me to pull, that pulled me to trying to help those that couldn't help themselves, the weaker person, right? So I was never a guy that beat up on somebody weaker than me. In fact, that incensed me when I seen another person beating up on someone that couldn't defend themselves. And so that was an attraction from childhood on up. But I started out doing corporate law. I worked for the largest law firm in the city of Cincinnati, uh, Tams, Stennis, and Hollister, right? And back then, my whole thought was, you know what, if I just make a lot of money, then I'll be happy. Because somehow happiness was equated with having a bunch of money, right, and having nice things. And so I kept thinking, well, you know, everybody kept saying, do corporate law. That's where the money is. Why would you want to go to law school and do, you know, criminal law? You don't make a lot of money. So I'm like, well, I'll try to do corporate law. And if I make a lot of money, at least I'll be happy doing it. So I did that for four years. And as I tell my students, uh, after four years, I had the house, the cars, the money, everything, and I still felt empty inside. You know, I wasn't doing what I truly loved to do. And I think Mark Twain said it best. The two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Right? Why are you here? What are you here on earth to do? Right? And so I can't explain it to anybody else. I just knew, even though I had not tried a case, in criminal law, that I was going to be a good criminal defense lawyer, so I left the law firm. I only had like two thousand dollars in the bank, and I said I'm starting my own practice. Right? I got a good mentor. Uh, within a year, I had I had a big murder case. It was on court TV back then. They don't have court TV anymore, right? And so that kind of put me in, you know, uh, got me out of there with some free advertising. Put you in the limelight. And then uh, I ended up representing people like Deion Sanders, Peter Frampton, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, wow. and I became very good at it. Um, and so, um, I don't, you know, I, didn't, I don't know how far you want me to go on it, but, but anyway, I ended up getting addicted to painkillers, uh, becoming a drug addict, right, at the height of my career, uh, and then came crashing down after 10 years of addiction to drugs and alcohol, right? Um, and ended up in the federal penitentiary, uh, since 24 months in, in the federal penitentiary. I already lost everything, right, in my mind. And so, in 2000, this all happened in 2007. My sobriety date is February 2nd, 2007. I've been sober since then. No mood altering drink or a drug. Um, and so I started doing Alcoholics Anonymous and I joined the Lawyer's Assistance Program in Ohio. And then my wife found a position out here because we had lost everything, right? And so uh, she found a job out here at Why Not Comp. And so I still had a criminal case pending in Ohio. So I would fly out here for a few weeks and I'd fly back for my criminal case in Cincinnati, never knowing when I came, when I left here, if I was coming back right. or going to prison. Right. Um, and when I came out here, the judges and lawyers assistance program, I had to go to meetings, right, according to the Bar Association in Ohio. 
So I would go to meetings and get my sheet signed. So I went to a meeting down there and I told my story to, to the director of the program there. I then he said, hey, do you want to go tell your story to the law students at UH? And I said, no, I don't want to go tell my story to you. Right? It's one thing, you know, if you go to an AA meeting, right, you tell your story and people look at you like, oh, man, is that all you did? Let me tell you what I did, right? You go tell your story to other people that haven't had an addiction to alcoholism, they're like, are you out of your mind? So I was like, no, I don't want to go tell you. And so I called my sponsor from Alcoholics Anonymous back in Ohio. I said, man, they want me to go up here and talk to these people. Uh, these law students, and I don't, you know, I'm afraid to go tell them my story. And he said, look, what did I tell you, right, when you got sober? That your job is to be a service to God and his children. God's job is to run your life. Why don't you go up there and see if you can help somebody, give them without expecting nothing in return. So I went and talked to Professor Randall Ross at this class. Right, right. And then uh, I went to prison in the next month. For 20, I was sentenced to 24 months. And I remember the judge asking me, and they, they quoted this in the newspapers. She said, well, you want to talk about whether or not I should give you probation or prison? And I said, you know what? At this point, I was two years sober, right? And I didn't have to no longer find out what it was taking to fill that hole in my soul that I, that I was trying to fill with all those material things. And I told her. I said, whatever you're going to tell me, it's going to be the best thing that ever happened to me. You tell me probation is going to be the best thing. You tell me prison is going to be the best thing. I'm waiting on you to tell me. And that, that was really, you know, I don't, I'm not a religious person, but I was really trusting God at this point, right? Because some of the best things that happened to me helped get me in the penitentiary. Some of the things that I thought had been the worst things that happened in my life, looking back, it turned out to be the best things that could ever happen. And so I've come to learn I'm the worst at judging what's good and bad <laughs> in my life, right? Because when I'm going through it, it may seem like it's bad. It's not until I get to the other side and I start connecting them dots. It's like, oh my God, that was the best thing that ever happened, right? You, you, you don't see the connection. You don't you, see the until connection. Until you, you have to stand back and look. And, and so there's certain things that I have to go through in order to get to where I need to be. And I always took the path of least resistance. See, I want to get through life without feeling no pain. I want to get through life without no commotion, right? And that's not what life is, right? It's, a, it, it's more of a journey, not a destination. Let me... Let me uh go back a little bit okay mm -hmm. so when you started practicing law you got on I mean you got you, you you got some publicity I mean you got some cases right what type of cases generally were you doing I, mean, oh, I did all, I did civil rights cases also police misconduct cases personal injury cases maybe 20 percent of my practice the majority of it was 80 80 percent of it was criminal defense work so I did everything from uh, death penalty cases on down to disorderly conduct speeding tickets also wow. Everything, the whole, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so have I. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and when you get these cases, I mean, when you get a murder case, okay, I mean, now you're, you're talking about hindsight too. Uh, but in those days, what did, you ask your, what did you ask your murder defendant client? Did you, did I wanted to know the truth. See, people always ask that question. I'll say, hey, man, did, did, let me ask you this question as a lawyer. Did you, do you ask your client to tell you the truth? And some lawyers really do say, no, I don't want to know. I wanted to know. And like I would tell my client, and most smart criminal defendants who have been in and out the system, they would tell their lawyer the truth. Because if I know what the truth is, and I know when everybody else on that witness stand is lying. Right. But if you're lying to me, and they lying, it's hard for me to cross-examine. But if you're sitting there telling me, look, man, I did it this way, but it ain't what she's saying, or it's not what he's saying, here's what really happened, then I can cross-examine on that. So I wanted to know. Now, I cannot ethically put you on a stand after you said that you committed the crime and have you say you did it. So I would always take the case with an eye on winning through cross-examination. Very seldom did I put witnesses on the stand. Very seldom did I present a defense. My whole thing was I should be able to win with your case by raising reasonable doubt. So you were defending a lot of people for various crimes. You were doing well. You know, what led you down that path? What, what, what led you down that, that path? I think that path started way before I started doing well. I think that path started from childhood, and I can't remember when it started, but my whole thought, like I said, when I was younger, it, it's not so much what happened to me that I turned out the way I did it in life, but it's the way I reacted to life. And at some point when I was young, I really did think, you know what happens is something that's going to come when I get here 
when I get there. So it was never enjoy the journey. It was never being in the moment, right? Life was. Mm -hmm. it, two, there's two things here. There's the end game, and then there's the when you're in it, is what I hear you telling me about. Is that, is that right? And well, it's, it's almost like, you know what, I'll be happy once I get this new car. Man, when I get this job or get this promotion, then I'll be happy. Man, if my wife straightens up, then I'll be happy. If these kids would just act the way, I, right? I needed everybody else around me to act a certain way in order for me to be okay in here, right? And that's just a backwards way of living, but I don't see it like that. I really do see, you know, that I need an education, I need a lot of money and all that, and when I get this, I'll be happy. And as I tell others when I speak, if money and having material things was the end all the happiness, I wouldn't have to watch Whitney Houston dying of a cocaine overdose in, in a bathtub in Vegas or read about Prince dying in his home elevator with Percocets in his pocket. Right. right, or Michael Jackson paying the doctor to stand next to him, pumping stuff in his veins so he can sleep at night. Yeah. So if money was the end all, so it can't be money. It can't be money. Right, and there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money, but for a man like me, I thought it was going to fix me. Right, M money's good. I mean, we all like money. Okay. Right. Let's be clear. I don't have anything against money, but I, I hear what you're saying. It, 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 you, I mean, you have clients, and you, who, all the money in the world, did them no good. Right. You, 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 you know, have a successful career. All the money means nothing. Right. right? And, and so the more that I got of those things that I thought was going to make me happy, the more, the sicker I got spiritually and mentally, right? Because I'm thinking, with well, that, I thought if I got this house, I'd be happy. You know, I got everything that I want, and there's still this hole in my soul, you know? And so um, when I hurt my shoulder lifting weights, and you see the epidemic with heroin now, right, and painkillers, so I tore my rotator cuff. And the doctor gave me Percocet. And then it started from there. And I became addicted to painkillers, Oxycontin, um, fentanyl, all that stuff that you read about, right? And it was horrible, man. I'm telling you, to be struggling like that. And I got to a point where I didn't want to live and I didn't want to die. I well, let, let, me, let me ask you. Uh, we're we're going to take a break in a minute. But I want to ask you a little bit about what you learned in Hong Kong and when there, whether there was any similarities oh, yeah. or, or anything you can tell us about I mean we're all humans and maybe just being in Hong Kong doesn't make a, too much of a difference I mean, you you came across the sea from Cincinnati to Hawaii right and now you've gone across the sea to Hong Kong I want to ask you after our break what did you learn what are the differences and that, that's a good question all right thank you we'll be right back Aloha, my name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live at from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to politicians to regulators to the utility so please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. I just walked by and I said what's happening guys? They told me they were making music. We are back with Ken Lawson, uh, professor at law school at the University of Hawaii, and we are talking about uh, a lot about being a lawyer uh, and practicing law, and it doesn't, doesn't just apply to criminal lawyers, I think it applies to all attorneys. And Ken, we, when we left, we talked a lot about your background, and also you went across the sea to Hong Kong. Yeah. From Hawaii. Yeah. And you, you gave a talk about the death penalty, I think. And, or, and, and, and actual innocence and how to defend. And wh I want to know, what did you learn? Are we all the same? I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that's the amazing thing. It's not just in Hong Kong. We see, as you know, we have a diverse population here in Hawaii. Right. So most of my students come from all over the world. It's not, you know, when I was in Cincinnati, um, 
10 years ago, it was more or less black and whites, right, with a few Hispanics in the population. That was it. Coming to such a diverse university, right, and teaching, what I've come to learn, getting to, your, to the heart of your question, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that all people are the same, right? And there's a, there's a certain language of the heart when it talks about justice. And so when I went to Hong Kong, uh, I had no idea what the Chinese system was like, so I'm trying <laughs> to read a book on the plane going over there, right, <laughs> about actual innocence and, and some of the projects they've done over there with respect to actual innocent cases and, and the death penalty. And, and, and it made, one, it made me more grateful about our system, even though I have a lot mm -hmm. of complaints mm -hmm. about our legal system. After hearing what these defense, because a lot of those defense lawyers from China had to come to Hong Kong in order to avoid persecution. They couldn't sit at a seminar like that in China right. um, without some, some, some threat of getting locked up themselves or being in violation of some law. Uh, so that's why they, we had it in Hong Kong. But to hear, the, hear their stories, and we sat in there, Mark. We sat, I sat in a room at Hong Kong University so that they had interpreters, and I had these headphones on, and they, you know, so the other uh, Chinese defense lawyers were talking about their cases. And I was only supposed to be there for a few hours. I stayed the whole two days. Um, and it was just amazing. But again, when we talk about justice, right, that's not something that we can teach. You're an attorney. You can't teach justice to anybody. Justice is a matter of the heart. It's something that you feel inside where it's like, you know what, this don't feel fair. Something about the situation is unfair. And that language crosses the borders, man. So in, in, what did you hear from the Chinese lawyers? What, what, what are some e examples of what they were talking about that affected you or made you think? Of how, how, how the death penalty can be applied to, like here, it has to be proportional. Right. And so back in, in, in the 70s, when the person would, had raped someone and they were, you know, sentenced to death, the Supreme Court I, came I back and that's that. not proportional. There, if you're, if you're stealing and stuff like that, you can maybe be subjected to the death penalty. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know. OK. Now, now, how did the Chinese feel about that? I mean, were, were they were they saying, well, yeah, I mean, that's OK. Or were they saying, well, wait a minute, that's that's too harsh. Or is that what you were they talking were saying, about? They were saying it's too harsh. Too, okay. yeah, the defense, they were all defense lawyers. They were saying it was too harsh because we know now through DNA that many people who were sentenced to death yeah. have been actually and factually innocent. Yeah. And there's a big difference between, between being wrongfully convicted and actually innocent. You can be wrongfully convicted and guilty as hell, right? right, right, right. But, but if you're actually innocent, and right. DNA has shown us, right, that there have been many so people were, were sentenced the, were, to death were row. the Chinese attorneys, I mean, were, did, they, did they focus on that too? And, 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 yeah. and, 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 and were they saying that this is... A, a social feeling generally throughout China that this is a little harsh or or was it a social feeling? It's that it changing. Was okay? Yeah, it's changing. My understanding is again, I'm not an expert on China, but from my limited experience with these mm -hmm. defense lawyers mm -hmm. in, in Hong Kong uh, was that it has been changing over the last so, several socially, years. Socially. So, socially and, and legally. Uh, um, but, but the government is different from, from yes. the legal process. Is, is, yeah, is very, that, is that right? very, very different. Very um, different. I mean, I felt kind of bad for them. One good thing that they are doing, though, is they're now re recording the interrogations that the police conduct because you had a lot, the way that they would get confessions, right. you know, I mean, beating confessions out of suspects, you know what I mean, torture, et cetera. Um, and that has, at least because of the death penalty and people being sentenced that are actually innocent, has led China to now uh, at least require that the interrogations be recorded. So that's a positive step. We need so it here. From, from a government, okay, so tell me a little bit. Tell me what you like about our system compared to China, what you, and what you, what you like, like about China compared to us. I mean. The, well, the only thing I, <laughs> I like about the China system is the fact that they record interrogations. Other and than they, that, I they feel don't do that now? They don't do that here? Some, some, some states are starting to do that, or some departments are starting to do that, but no. Generally speaking. Generally speaking, no, okay. um, it, it's not recorded. And so 20, DNA has shown us that 20, percent of people who confessed were actually innocent mm -hmm. and most people say well you know why would you confess to committing a murder that you never I would never confess to committing a murder that, that I never did but you look at the Central Park Five right yeah, yeah. they all confess right and, and one thing DNA has shown us 20 percent of those confessions are false confessions so it happens right um, anyway so so on 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 that side on the China side the required or it appears to be that the keeping track of what happens in the interrogations, good. You'd rather be a defendant in America, right? 
Almost yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah. Most, yeah. That's some scary stuff, man. With no trial by jury, you know, the, the, the jury trial here, to me, is, 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 is so important. Um, and, it's, and we still need work. And I'm not talking about the grand jury and just the, the jury trials that, that we allow our citizens to get here uh, that the Constitution guarantees are vital. Uh, and in those countries that don't have that, what stops the government with all of its power and all of its might from descending on that poor citizen? Right, and our juries can do that. Our juries are a buffer between the might and power of the state and that citizen that may be sitting there helpless. And the only thing between justice and that 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 and injustice is you and that jury, you being a defense lawyer. Right, right. Now, let's let's go past the jury for a minute. Let's talk about sentencing. Okay, you talked about sentencing earlier. Uh, you you accepted a sentence. There's been a lot of talk, especially in the press, about certain people getting sentenced to light sentences and others being more harsh. And for example, a, a young man was uh, uh, sentenced to f for four years for har harassing a seal, endangered seal. Another young man got 45 days for killing endangered birds. Yeah. You know? And if you're a citizen out there in the jury pool, Maybe you're wondering, how does that happen? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, why, why are, and, and then somebody uh, gets in a car accident uh, under drugs, convicted of manslaughter, gets a year and a half. Somebody else uh, gets four years for something that doesn't seem comparable to the death of a human being. All right. What are we talking about? What, what is, I mean, what is, it's a mystery. The sentencing, it seems to us, to a lot of the lay people out there. What's going on? Well, judges have discretion in sentencing. Uh, back when the Obama administration was in, as, as far as the federal sentencing is concerned, a lot of the clemency that he granted was based on unfair sentencing, right? And so the federal government tried to come up with a point system to make to bring truth and sentencing. And it really didn't bring any truth to sentencing. You still had the same type of comparisons between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, et cetera. Getting back to this, it's human, right? It's human nature, it's, it's, it's all kind of biases. I may see a student from Punahou, oh, he's got a great future. I don't want to ruin his future, I'll give him 45 days. I have no idea what the defendant's background was with the seal, but, but if I don't see those two people as equal human beings, in other words, if I implicitly, maybe not consciously, but just implicitly, see that you may be more savable than this person, I may alter your sentence, right? And it's unfair. It, too, it truly is unfair, right? What are the factors being placed in? And so the implicit bias and explicit bias, right? Studies show that the minority defendants are being sentenced at a higher rate than non-minorities. You know, you had the case in California, the rape case where the kid got, what, six months or something to that effect? Um, right. And, yeah. Right? And so how does that happen? Yeah. How do, uh, so your your mind is still questioning that. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, you you you've told me that you think there's just inherent biases that some of our implicit are implicit ex and are explicit, right? Uh, yeah. But I mean, when you again, you got two species that are important to preserve, but two awfully different sentences. Yeah. Right. So yeah, basically the the same thing in in a way. Yeah. Right. Very, very curious. Yeah. Now. Let's, let's think about this. You, you've had experience in the criminal law system as a defense attorney and being involved in the system yourself. Why is there crime? How do we stop it? Is there anything that can be done? Or is it just human nature that we're always going to have it and just you're always gonna have, you're, live with it? You're always going to have crime. The question is, can we uh, reform our system? much like they did in the Netherlands and other countries, right, to where we're just not sending our people off to prison. I mean, here in Hawaii, we send our, our, our citizens who commit crimes, who do wrongs, to Arizona. And how do we tell you that, that, that you're rehabilitatable if you can't see your family, right. right, because they can't afford to come out there and visit you? What hope are we giving you when we say you go off to another state and when you come back, you better not mess up again? We're in other jurisdictions. And, and countries, what they're doing is saying, okay, listen, you committed a crime 
it hurts you, it hurts your family, and it, you, there were victims, and you hurt society. So now we're going to do what's called, and, and we're, there's a group doing restorative justice here, right? Some restorative justice. So that you can make amends for what you did, so that people that you hurt can talk to you, right? So that you can still understand that, yes, you made this mistake, you got to pay for it, but there's still hope for you. And the crime rate goes down. So we got to think of a different way to punish people, just like me, right? I did wrong. I had to accept my, the consequences for the wrong that I did, right? And make amends, financial amends and verbal amends to those people. And not just that I'm sorry, but how can I make it right? And what that does, it allows me to become clean again. You know, we're going to have to come back and talk about sentencing and how it works. But I want to give you an opportunity to give advice to a young lawyer just starting out in practice. What, what, what do you tell them? What do you tell in, a, in a one sentence? What's your best advice to a, a young lawyer looking out? Cars that, you, that, you, that, you, that, that you are the best lawyer the best lawyer in this state, or whatever state you're practicing in, being okay with who you are. That once you can accept, and I'm with all my faults, all my weaknesses, all my strengths, all my mistakes that I've made in my past, all these things make me who I am. And I'm okay being me. And I can be me in front of you, in front of a judge when I go home. I don't have to open up that door when I go home and take a deep breath like I got to, you know, oh my God, I'm glad I'm home. Like I got to turn back into who I really am. I'm me no matter where I go because I'm okay with who I am. You know, your advice is good for young lawyers and old lawyers, yeah. <laughs> my friend. Ken, thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you for having me, brother. Thank you, everybody. We will be back in two weeks with another Law Across the Sea program. Aloha. <laughs>